Hello, Sean Albertson. Welcome to the Doing CX Right Show. Stacy, it is so great to be with you here today. I'm so looking forward to our conversation. I appreciate the invite. Oh, well, we have a lot of uh, superstar friends in common, so we were bound to meet. Absolutely, absolutely. So first, let's start off with a little bit about you. Who are you? What do you do for a living? Sure. So I worked in customer experience for the last 20 plus years. Uh, Started in customer service, as you know, and many do, before it was called customer experience. And uh, But really focusing on understanding the experience. And I worked in training and quality across across contact centers and ran contact centers and uh, have done so for some pretty big names. Uh, Most recently, Charles Schwab just finished my tenure there. But uh, after 20 years of doing it for one company at a time, I, I started my own business. And so now I am a professional speaker, a coach, and a consultant on all things customer experience, working with uh, businesses uh, and really helping them find the right mix uh, of creating great experiences, but balancing and, and fixing those things that are problems. Mm. What's a fun fact that people might not know about you? Sure. Well, a lot of people who look at me wouldn't think and know that uh, in college, I was a lead singer of a rock band. Uh, I did not go very far. It was just a <laughs> college fun thing to do. But I had hair down below my shoulders and uh, and and then I had to clean up for corporate world. But uh, yeah, that's a fun fact to, about myself. I Being a professional speaker now, I'm on stage again, just in a very different way. So, you know. Absolutely. Well, I uh, will have to ask you for some photographs to see what the younger Sean looked like. But Speaking of younger Sean, a question I love to ask everyone is that if you could go back in time and give advice to your 20-year-old self based on what you know now that you didn't know then, what would you say to the younger you? Well, that's a great question. Uh, and you know, one of the things, so growing up as the CX industry really was growing up, I found myself kind of bouncing a, a, around a lot laterally. So I, I obviously I started in contact centers and customer service, but then I moved around into marketing, into product and pricing, into technology teams, and then even into digital teams, all doing experience work. And I felt for a while there because it was a lot of lateral moves that, man, maybe I'm not really moving forward like I should. But in all honesty, looking back now, that was the most valuable time. And so I would have told myself, embrace it. Embrace the diverse experience because today's consumer and consumer environment <laughs> is so complex. Being able to you know understand it from everyone's di- you know different perspective has really helped me. And so I'd kind of go back and tell myself, really lean in on those opportunities. And I I say that to other younger people coming up in CX yeah. today is don't be afraid to try different. Uh, unfortunately, call it different X's, UX, CX, BX, brand experience, etc. But don't be afraid to try different ones because they'll just make you more well-rounded and ultimately pay off in the long run for sure. Oh, I agree with you because I had the same zigzag as you did. So we have a very similar path. And I agree, you don't realize in the moment, especially in a corporate environment, you're so focused on up. Yeah. And... And up means so many different things. And now when you reflect back, it it was the variety of experiences that makes us who we are. So I agree wholeheartedly. Yeah. Let's get into the meat of the show. This is doing CX right, doing customer experience right. That has different definitions to people. What does that mean to you? Well, first off, I'd actually say... In my, you know, when I speak on stages and when I talk to companies, I have a bigger message of let's just do experience right. Let's not over qualify it with a letter in front of it. Um, It's all about the customer, but ultimately there's so many different ways you can do it. So when I think about doing the experience right, it's understanding and meeting the customer where they are, when they are, and how they are, because it is getting, again, it's so much more complex, you know. Mm -hmm more than i think the the statistic was more than 50% of consumers use up to 6 different contact channels with their businesses and so you know they're hitting you customers are are hitting you from all different angles and it's really understanding how that stitches together a big part of my philosophy if you will and it's not that different than most but i really focus in on it is about the customer journey it's about how a customer moves you know 
potentially back and forth between channels more often than it is, you know, one channel, one task. It's really about that experience across journeys and platforms and technology and human interaction, all the different and how they add up. And unfortunately, in most organizations, they're not designed to really think that way. Yeah, the, the the silos and the you know and the different channel uh, you know uh, issues are yeah. are very prevalent still today, even though a lot of people know that that's an issue. Oh, you touched on so many topics here. So <laughs> yes, I agree with you. It is all about the X's, and I do focus on the customer experience because obviously people in business are so focused on the customer. But we know that there is no customer without the work teams involved. So yes. And I think it's also important for people to remember that it's really bringing the heart to business. As technology is booming, that is the biggest controversy. Uh, What is your view with the emerging technology and yet we are humans? How do we merge? How do we work together? Well, I think that the reality is users will use technology when they want to use technology. And that will continue. And that's how it's always been. There will be adopters. There will be some that don't adopt. I also think wholeheartedly that the more technology we push on customers, the more they're going to want the human interaction. And so a lot of the consulting I do with companies, I, I talk first about, well, let's look at your current channels and make them better before you worry about creating new channels. Because, mm-hmm. you know, generative AI and the chat GPT and all of that to be self-service and chatbots, that's got a ways to go. And, and oh, by the way, they're only good if they're sitting on top of your data and it's good. So there's a lot of learning to be done. And so a lot of focus being on leverage the technology to improve the performance of, of your people, for instance, allow them to create even greater efficiencies using that kind of technology and then you're you're ahead of the game because you're still bridging that human gap that is is coming or will come for a lot of organizations but you're you're learning you're you're learning what of your data is not good and you're learning where to make those improvements before you go out and you know try to replace an interaction with a, a piece of technology yeah. so it needs to be synergistic we've got to bring the people along because the way i talk about it it's people process and then platform and I say platform instead of technology because it's really about the integration of all the different technologies into a seamless platform that our customers demand. And so, but you have to get your people right, you get your processes right, and then you can go for that platform in that way. Who is doing experience right? Who stands out in your mind and why? You know, I think there are quite a few companies that are have already started to really embrace you know, this opportunity. Um, and, you know, there's a couple of brand names out there. I, I have some friends over that work over at Best Buy within their team. You know, they're breaking down silos. They're bringing th- things together and doing things that really, um, you know, are, are game changer. I, I'd like to say Schwab, having le- just left Schwab, uh, they're doing great things. Um, they're no- well known already for great, you know, customer experience and, and client experience. And they're doubling down on that capability as well. Um, the unfortunate reality is I can name plenty of people who are doing it worse, <laughs> far easier than I can say people that are doing it great. Um, and I think we all have that experience as consumers ourselves, unfortunately. Yes. Oh, absolutely. Oh, this could be all about the Doing CX Wrong show. Because <laughs> they're really good case studies. But so people are listening today. They work at different companies and leadership roles. What, from your experience, can they actually do? You talked about data. What can they do with the data to make it a better experience? So as we think about this journey, and so, uh, you know, I talk about the journey like a river. We like to think our customers are on a nice, straight, smooth flow down a river in an inner tube with a cold one. They're not. They're in class five rapids. They're bouncing off of rocks. They're they're whining all over the place because they're hitting our our rocks, our challenges that we create for them, unfortunately. So for me, it's really about uh, aligning your organization to a purpose and and mm. then driving that in a way that says, if we're all working together for purpose X, then you know, let's go that route. So uh, to dig in a little bit more to that, you had Matt Dixon. On the phone, and I, I've shared the stage with Matt and been able to speak, you know, with him about the effortless experience earlier on. Um, and you know, I fall in that customer effort score uh, idea. But 
I kind of took what they did in my book and took it a little bit further to say it's about bringing that that not just the survey, but all this other data together where we're saying text analytics against transcripts, CRM notes, uh, com survey comments, really any of that. It's bringing journey analytics, stitching the data together between the different channels so you know who was online before they had to call, before they had to chat, et cetera. That takes a lot of work. Now, there are also opportunities that everyone can take today. Most companies are using tools like that but they don't even know that they're available. So first, mm -hmm. I, I talked to a company the other day and I asked them, all right, so who, how are you recording your calls? And like, oh, we use, you know, vendor XYZ. Okay, great. What are you using that data for? Well, if someone calls for a complaint, we look up the call. And? Oh, that's it. Yeah. And it's like, <laughs> oh, well, that's rich data there. I mean, just a little bit of elbow analytics uh, and some skill. You can start to pull out of that the themes and the context and the opportunity, even emotion using sentiment. And most of the vendors these days have those tools, but a lot of businesses don't even think that way. Um, I was talking to a digital team. They wanted, they wanted me to build 50 surveys for them across their website. And I'm like, no, you're not going to get what you want because response rate is going to be low. And then the people that do respond are going to barely give you any comments. And sure, you know, and so what we did rather, we, we stitched the day together and then we actually pulled out from the call transcripts clients who said, I had an issue with the website. We flagged that. We created a metric out of that against the calls. And we could then go in and do text analytics study of everyone who said they had an issue. What were they trying to do? What was the issue on the website? It became so much more valuable than a, than a survey. And this is where the new AI and the new capability is just making all of this so much easier. You can literally go and ask a tool to say, hey, tell me about people who had this experience, you know, who tried to do this, what was their experience like? And it, that generative component is going to very quickly be able to tell us all this great mm. information that we otherwise were oblivious to in the past. So a lot of it obviously is reactive to the data, but also using data for predictive behaviors. And we know problems are inevitable. However, we can minimize these problems and get ahead of it from it piling up as you talk about. So share, what does that mean? What could people do? So a big part of it is, so as I mentioned earlier, customer effort score, the way we started and the way I've started, we used it, customer effort score to measure the experience. So we knew what they were calling us about or what they were going online and what was their effort. Mm -hmm. Well, then we were able to really step back and start to understand you know, the connectivity between those two channels. But as we go through this process of digging deep, we use the same learnings to predict. CES for anybody that doesn't take a survey. So now you're using a the small sample of surveyed customers to validate the model. And then you use predictive analytics to actually identify those people who are potentially moving into that space. This mm -hmm. is where you start to be able to do more. Uh, I, I ran into a new uh, earlier uh, or last month, I ran into a new term. I'm trying to get it out there as much as possible. Situationalization. So it's not just personalization. It's personalization also to the situation they're dealing with right now. Situationalization. It's not really a word, obviously, but <laughs> you know, really going into that understanding that now as we, you're using this data in real time, you can literally, we will, we're getting to this point now, we can see that this percentage of customers are starting down a, a potentially negative path. So don't whack a mole wait till it's done. Interrupt first. Interrupt sooner. I use an example I... Um, I have uh, two example, great examples of the right way and the wrong way. Uh, I had an issue with a bank. I literally had to call them for two months straight, twice a week. Each call was about two hours. I would always have to start over, re-explain everything, you know, to the offshore resource. It was it was so <laughs> painful, and and I finally got it resolved. But it was it was atrocious. The experience was absolutely atrocious. On the other hand, I had another company I was working with that I had to call. Twice, and then all of a sudden, they picked up that I was a frequent flyer. So they then actually said, "Hey, I, we've noticed you've called a couple of times. Seems like you're having an issue that that you know is a little more complicated." And I actually, what was cool about it, I didn't have to call anymore because they routed me to an offline group because it was a complex situation in that case as well. 
who then we were able to trade emails and solve the issue without ever having to call again. And a lot of people think call avoidance is about going and finding calls to automate. I would actually say study your your own customers because I guarantee you one of your biggest call problems is not getting the resolution on the first, second, or third time. (laughs) Any little bit of analytics can highlight those customers. And again, if you're getting them towards resolution, they don't need even need to talk to you as long as they can communicate and get a status and an update. It becomes much more effective and cost-effective for the business and much more effective for the customer and their experience. One thing you touched upon that's giving me a a little shiver here is when I call the airlines, I love that I have the option to call customer service and I love that I have the option to text. In fact, on the call, when you're waiting, they tell you if you want to get a text message, that's an option and shorter and quicker. So I often opt into that and I like a record of the conversation anyway. But here is the pain. The pain is that I get a different answer from whoever is chatting with me on a text or on the phone. There's no consistency. And therefore, as a smart customer, I know if I don't get the answer I want, I go find another agent. Yeah. But from the brand perspective, that should not be the case. Right. Do you see that? Well, oh, absolutely. A- everyone does. It's and it's that fishing for your answer, right? You you keep calling until you you get through to the person who gives you the answer you want, right? <laughs> um and that's another, you know, issue of creating volume for a lot of call centers. Again, th- think a little bit about generative AI. Generative AI especially is it looks at mass amounts of data and summarizes it in a relatively pithy way. It kind of it gives you kind of a, a review. So a couple of use cases, and everybody's talking about chat uh, or using it for you know chat bots and things like that. But he- here's what I would recommend, and what I do recommend to a lot of organizations, and I, I kind of started on it a little earlier. Use it for your employees and and tie it into your back office system. So for instance, I guarantee you what that company did that picked up on call number three, they were running generative AI. And the next time I called, they realized by looking back over recent transactions, looking back over recent CRM notes, they realized something was going on that need because it was all very similar context. That is what generative AI can do. Quickly summarize that. Now, a couple of things you can do with it. You can personalize insert activity, or you feed it right up to that next agent. And they're now reading off of the same summary that the previous agent, and they're already now on the same page. Now using the same kind of generative AI on the back end for um, uh, agent support tools, whoever you talk to, based on that summary alone now, they should all be looking at the same knowledge and information. The, yeah. you know, those articles, are, generative AI is looking across the articles and summarizing at the top level. Now you're absolutely creating consistency. And that same function can work across chat, phone, any number of ways. And so that mm-hmm. is what's so exciting about this environment is using this explosion of new capability. To, again, going back to make your human channels better double down on them. Oh, and by the way, with that same generative capability, talking to the call center managers now and so forth, now you can insert a lot more next best action or even marketing opportunities, et cetera, create more of that value center that we've always Mm -hmm. talked about for 20 some odd years in call centers, being more of a value center by using the technology to solve more effectively, create better experiences so that the customer is willing to listen to those other opportunities to upsell, cross-sell, or otherwise improve their experience as well. Mm. Now, people listening, those who are in the contact center space, this is gold. Those that are not in the contact center space, I want them to realize that this is any employee, the consistency, the sales, frontline salespeople. I mean, how many times did they give some response to a customer and then the customer hears a you know a different marketing message. It's again silos don't work. Yes, exactly. I, you know, and we won't really change. Probably, we won't change the siloed nature of businesses. You know, channels ultimately have owners because there's got to be a level of accountability. What I am seeing advanced companies do though is creating these kind of tiger teams. Um, mm-hmm. uh, you know, I'll call them a rocks team where they're they're. 
it's a cross-functional group, web, mobile, you know, phone, chat, you know, back office, sales. And they're working together for one journey. Easiest journey is onboarding. Let's just say the onboarding journey, which is usually multiple step over time, etc. But they're working together in this project mode to say, we're looking, if you will, using my river analogy, we're looking upstream and downstream to make sure that, you know, as the experience is being engineered and orchestrated, that's a new term that a lot of people are talking about, it's done so with a level of uh, understanding across the different contact points. And when I work with companies that are doing that, uh, they're actually able, you know, I, what I see a lot of times is the web team is going like, oh, wait, so if I did this, it mean it would make your call that much more efficient when you finally got the call. It's like, yes, now you've got the teams working in partnership um, across those those opportunities, and they're still run in their own silos that are you know from a standpoint, but you've, you're breaking it down from a project perspective to create that kind of orchestrated journey, if you will. Well. <laughs> How do I verbalize this? Because I'm heated from my own experiences around <laughs> this topic, which is shared goals. Why do you have the digital team have their goals and then you have the retail have their goals? They're not matching. So now a customer comes and depending on what channel they go to, it's a different experience. And each one cares about making their numbers as yeah. opposed to the collective looking like one company. It, it oh, irritates me. Yeah. <laughs> well, and that's where, uh, you know, organizations that are taking the CX approach, the customer experience approach, you know, it's not very common, but having a chief customer officer or, uh, you know, chief experience officer, yeah. even better, you know, organizations that are looking like that, they have their tiered. Customer experience is the number one goal. Then operational metrics across the you know business units is secondary, um, and I've been worked at some companies that were phenomenal in doing that because you know yes financial you know three out of the top five financial or top metrics of the company were financial but two of them were experience based in this case net promoter score and then you know as well uh, you know more of a loyalty measure as well a physical loyalty measure. That's where we we have to understand. And the OKRs, if you look at uh, objective and key results, you have to layer these pieces under that. And and organizations that create that approach, then you do, you you can sometimes hopefully avoid the argument that says, well, this metric handle time. Use an example. We got to get handle time lower. Well, handle time can actually be you, you may take it too low. You're going to sacrifice your experience, obviously, because you're just jumping off the phone. But you have to be able to articulate it. Again, it goes back to real data because executives can't just go off of a, a CX practitioner's gut. They've got to see this. They've got to see which journeys are struggling. Why are they struggling? How, what's that impact? So yeah. I'll, I'll use an example and you know, on, I'll close on this question for, specifically for this. But we knew net promoter score predicted loyal behavior. It Promoters... Um, were definitely more likely to retain and hire assets, but detractors four times more likely to attrit have negative assets. So very predictive. Problem was net promoter score as a relationship metric isn't always that predictive. But when we launched the customer effort score, when we first launched it, someone who said it was hard to do, something was hard to do, high effort, they were four times more likely to be a detractor. As time went by, that's grown. They're now five times more likely to be a detractor and therefore likely to be disloyal. Well, that's what Matt talked about in the Eiffel experience, that whole boot, that prediction of loyalty. There's nothing more actionable than showing the business, the web team, the phone team, even more importantly, both of them together when there's a disconnect to say, if you make this easier, bum, 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 here's the, here's the financial impact. Now you're yeah. starting to get the skin in the game in that context, but it's it's a hard it's a hard sell if it's not a top down driven you know approach to CX. And uh, a lot of us in Bootstrap can only go so far up <laughs> up the channel. Yes, and for listeners, as you're referencing Matt Dixon, he was on the po my podcast uh, early on, so uh, you can find him, and he goes deep into this effort score. As we're getting to the end, rapid fire questions here. Uh, technology is advancing. There's a lot we don't know. 
But based on where the trends are, what would you say that people need to do today so that they can be successful in the next 10 years? What is important that they do now? Ignore the technology for a little while. Focus more on your people. What is the purpose of your people? Align them. It goes back to what you were saying earlier. Align them on what they're here to accomplish. Why are they working together? What's important? Secondly, then start getting your measurement processes in place. The how are you mm. going to share information across channels, et cetera? Because adding one more channel to an already complex mix is not going to do anything better. So focus more on people and process before you even consider technology. Because again, you garbage in, garbage out. You put brand new spanking technology on really bad data and it's not going to matter. <laughs> yes. And I'm also going to say, okay, use ChatGPT, but please, please edit it. <laughs> Don't yes. just, I cannot believe what people put out there. And it is so obvious they didn't write it. And there's none of them in the co the communications. It's, yeah. it's awful. So please, over the years, <laughs> bring yourself to your content, please. All right. If I had a ton of CEOs and leaders in my room right now, entrepreneurs, what's the one takeaway you want them to remember? Focus on the entire journey of the customer, not just the transactions or the channels. The experience today is everything. Everything and everyone at your company creates great experiences or bad experiences. So you can't, you've got to go into it eyes wide open, in a cross-functional view and plan on it that way. So glad you said that because in 2024, I have a book on journey management coming. So I agree with you and a lot more to come. And then finally, leadership. We know that it starts on the inside. There's no customer experience without great, loyal, empowered work teams. What is the best leadership advice you've received or given to someone else? Well, again, EX is one of those Xs, uh, employee experience as well. And, and you can't go into, you can't talk about the customer experience without knowing you've got to do as much investment in your people as you are in your, you know, in your customers. I, I've seen a bunch of companies where they spent millions of dollars on an external facing website and the company employees are still using, you know, stuff from the, you know, 90s, you know. Uh, and so you've got to make sure you're investing just as much and driving that value for the employee so they can understand how is this new technology going to help them. And it's just got to be a key investment uh, regardless. Well, thank you for sharing your wisdom and such great information. I know that people will want to get in touch with you and all the details will be in the show notes. So thank you so much for sharing with all of us today. Absolutely. Thanks for having me again, Stacey. I appreciate it. <laughs> 